Good morning, everyone. I think it's about time to begin. It's good to see everybody. I like to see everybody together, but I guess we're still a ways away from being able to do that. But it's good to see everyone here this morning. We still have people coming in. It seems that everybody, most everybody's on that side of the building, but that's, that's all right. A few announcements to make before we start this morning. First of all, uh, as the way we've been doing it normally lately, the contribution baskets are on one of the back tables, so if you want to give a gift, that's where you'll find that. Also, the Lord's Supper supplies are back there, and if you don't know how to work them, they can be a little tricky. The bread is under the top cellophane, and I'm still not working mine too well, but anyway. They're back there as well. Uh, ben and Corbin will come by and pick up the empties from the uh, communion after that service is over, so we'll pick those up for you. Ronnie and Marita McKee have a brand new grandbaby. Um, I have the name here, Rockland, Rockland. Ryan and Amber had a little boy, was that... I believe that was Friday, wasn't it? Anybody? I think it was Friday at the Weatherford Hospital, but everybody's doing, doing well. Last night, yesterday afternoon, I was in here working, tidying up a little bit and turned the air conditioning on and was here for several hours and it was not getting cool in here. So I called Mark Garrison and this was at six o'clock last night and he was really good to come and he said, we have a problem, so if we get a little hot today, it's because he said he could not possibly get it fixed until tomorrow. In the process of that, however, he told me that he had just gotten his wife, Carrie, home from the hospital, and, and so we, I told him we would put that on our prayer list. Uh, he thought at that time she had just dehydration. Is that what it was? And I know for a fact that can be very troubling. That cost me a stay in the hospital, so... Let's remember Carrie in prayer and uh, Ryan and Amber McKee with their new baby. Is there anything else that needs to be said this morning that I have overlooked? If not, let's begin our worship service with a word of prayer, please. Almighty God, we are so grateful to you this morning for so many things for the beauty of this land, for the beautiful days and nights, for the fact, dear Lord, that you are here with us at this moment. We are awed and humbled to know that and to know that you hear us as we speak to you in prayer. We pray, dear Lord, that you would have, help us to live each moment of our lives knowing that you are right beside us. Dear God, we want to pray for this congregation. We pray for strength in your word and for strength in your service. Help us to be known far and wide as people that are about your business. We want to pray, dear Lord, this morning for uh, Ronnie and Marita and Ryan and Amber and their new grandson, Rockland. We want to pray for Carrie Garrison, for others that are hurting, those who are lonesome, those that are in need, hungry. We pray, dear Lord, that you would bless this country and its leaders and all the problems that we are now encountering. Please, dear Lord, bless those of our nation who are given so much in the form of service. Please be with us all as we continue to move forward. In moments of temptation, we pray for your strength and we beg forgiveness of our sins. These things we pray through Christ. Amen. Number 42 will be our first song. 4-2.
number 123. 123. We'll sing all three verses and then the chorus at the end. On thy unglorious summit stood a numerous host, redeemed by blood. They hid their king in strength divine. I heard the song and soul to join. I heard the song and soul. Please bow with me. Father, we come today to worship your name, to acknowledge you as God Almighty, the creator of the universe, creator of our lives, and the sustainer of our lives. Father, we, thanks, we give thanks for everything you've given us, but we especially give thanks today for those who are here, who haven't been here in a long time. We love to see them here, and we're glad they're here. Father, we always need trust to trust you. We ask for that trust. We ask for the confidence that David had, the trust that Daniel had, the trust that so many of the believers and prophets in your, in your scriptures had, that even though they're beset upon the worst circumstances and times in which they would test their faith and maybe even want to give it up, that they never did. They always knew that you were true and just and right and that everything would turn out good because you are good. Lord, today we are faced with a world that is full of strife and turmoil. It comes and goes. Sometimes it's small pockets. Sometimes it's massive upheaval. We're experiencing that right now, Lord. And we have people on all sides of all different viewpoints and opinions. And these are people who sometimes in normal circumstances they would get along, but now they don't. Or another might be the, even the vice versa. Well, Lord, we come to you now in prayer because to that end, we want to pray for our leaders on all levels, local, state, and national. Everyone is divided. 
They're divided in their politics. They're divided in their speech. They're divided in their hearts sometimes. They're even divided in, there's divisions in, among your body, which we know is wrong. And most of it's done because of these political problems. We recognize there are injustices in this world. That is because we live in a fallen world. We understand that sometimes we don't get all the facts before we react. Sometimes we don't react and then the facts come out and we should be outraged and we're not. Our Lord says in Matthew 24 that in the last days the love of many will grow cold and I think that's what we see today. It's not just people, Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives, it's among Christians too. I felt this, I know many of us have felt this, where we see so much of these things happen, <clears throat> we just chalk it up to that's just how it is, and we have a cold nature toward it. And even though we might disagree with the ways things are handled, help us to have open hearts and love people for no matter who they are, whether it's politics, whether it's faith, different faiths that we can bring, bring them Christ that <clears throat> so they can see the, the truth or it's race, or it's sexuality, or whatever it is, that we don't approach it with coldness, we approach it with love, because that's what we're supposed to do, because Christ loved us. We ask our leaders to, put, to, be, to ask for godly wisdom. We ask for them to put partisanship aside. It's difficult when you're in, it's in, so ingrained in our country. But the heart of Christ should be reflected in all of us. And many of us, because of our political leanings, we sometimes grow cold in that respect. Help us to not do that. It doesn't mean we compromise. It doesn't mean that our opinions aren't valid. But we have to not just approach it with, ah, that's just a bunch of people doing stuff that I don't, doesn't, mat doesn't matter to me, doesn't, doesn't register to me at all because I'm here in Cordell or wherever else. We have to love people even when they don't love us. We are seeing this happen in the world right now. But Lord, help us to be the light in the world. We're oftentimes not. Even the most ardent of your believers sometimes are not. But we ask this to continue forward. We ask us to improve in that way. That's part of our sanctification as people who are, have been adopted as children of God. Help us to go forward doing this and to to truly love others as we love ourselves. Thank you for this congregation, Lord, and thank you for everyone here, and help us to sing praise to your name and hear a message from your word and to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. We pray all this in his precious name. Amen. For the lesson number 687, 687. Men, if y'all will all sing with me and the women the echo, please. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he. Invitation song will be number 27, 2, 7.
As always, we are really glad to see all of you here this morning, and it's interesting and good to see Janet and Doris to be with us. They walked in the back door a few minutes ago, and they were, had a balance to their step, and they were delighted to be here because they've been kind of held in confinement for almost three months. I, I'm not sure how I'd handle that, but I think they handle it a lot better than I. So we're glad you're here, and, and uh, we're glad all of you are here and, and back with us. I, uh, I know that we're still practicing all the distancing, and, and rightfully so. I, I've kind of put that on a back burner in my own mind and not paid a lot of attention to it, especially with all the news about riots and people in the streets, as Burke kind of mentioned in his prayer. But Susan and I were in Stillwater this last Wednesday night, and uh, I did agreed because a friend asked if I would come up there and speak, but it was the very first time that they had ever come back as a congregation since all this started. Uh, the city of Stillwater has been kind of more locked down for a longer period of time, and I don't know if you've ever been there, uh, but the auditorium seats about eight, nine hundred, maybe a thousand, and there were 50 people or so in the, in the audience, and they were, they were live streaming it just like we do, and uh, they had every other pew roped off, and they had no song books in the, in the uh, racks because they didn't want anybody touching the song books. And what they did that was most interesting to me was they uh, ushered you out row by row and asked you not to stay in the foyer to go outside if you wanted to visit. So it reminded me that, that we're still uh, taking this more seriously than I'd kind of let it be. And, and, uh, and above all else, I guess the caution is if you feel the least bit ill do not come for the safety of everyone and, and we're still trying to do that largely because our congregation is of that vulnerable age and so we want you to know that we're, we're, we're doing this for the concern of one another and for the love of one another so anyway I'm glad you're here I hope you'll be blessed by, by what we say what we do this morning in our, uh, in our lesson we're going to be looking again, and for the last time, for sure the last time, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now when we started this chapter, I, I did not think, nor I would I have ever dreamed, that we would be five lessons before we got through with this chapter. But we are in the fifth lesson, and we are in the most popular part of the story. We're in that story where the battle actually takes place between David and Goliath. And I'm going to read beginning in verse 40 and go through verse 51 because I want us to make sure that we see what God put in print regarding this story. But before I read, I want to remind you of something I've reminded you of many, many times. Human logic is a wonderful powerful tool. But when it comes to God, human logic will only take you so far. For most of the things written in this book go beyond the logic or the mind of a man. That's why we've been called to live by faith. And so you've heard me tell this before, but it's worth repeating. About eight years ago, a very popular author in this country wrote a book titled David and Goliath. I've read several of his books. I read this book. And he's really talking about how an underdog can win. Like in a sports team, the underdog can sometimes beat the one who's supposed to win. And in that respect, it's a, it's a really decent book to read. But he builds his entire premise on the story of David and Goliath, and he uses total logic to do it. And so what this author says is that Goliath had an abnormal growth hormone. So it turned him into a giant of giants. And he said that also produced in his brain a tumor that was putting pressure on something like his optic nerve and he could not see very well. And that's why in this story he'll invite David to come closer and closer so that he can see how to destroy him. And he says David being the underdog will outmaneuver him and use only the sling and a rock 
to be able to destroy him. Now that fits perfect logic, doesn't it? But it's not true. We're going to read the truth. And Burke in his prayer talked about what's going on in this nation and keeps going on in this nation. The need for love and the need for healing. I'll tell you what we really need. We need people to believe this story and believe all the other things that are written in the scripture as literal coming from God. And that might again change everyone, certainly for the better. So I want to read the story that God puts in print for us. I'm using a different Bible, so it's a little bit difficult for me to get used to. Bert gave me this Bible, and it's, uh, it's so soft and nice, I, I want to try to start using it all the time. But Verse 40. Then he, this is David, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with the sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I'll give your carcass and the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into the forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. So, once again, the story, and I only want to make a couple of brief points and maybe one observation. Goliath is indignant. He is angry because it's an insult to his pride for the Israelites to send someone like David out to fight him. But David is equally indignant and equally angry, not because of anything to do with his pride, but because Goliath has insulted his God and his father. You know, Goliath's used to fighting at least valiant soldiers. They come out and at least they can give some kind of a fight. And he's been asking for someone to come for 40 days and fight him. And now here comes, in Goliath's own words, someone who's not much more than a boy. We tried to 
We tried to make that point over and over again. He's not much more than a boy. He's not full grown. And of all things, he has no armor on. And he's carrying a staff in his hand. And he's got a little sling that's probably not too noticeable. And Goliath looks at him and thinks, what an insult. How, how dare these people. Did you catch his words? Am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? Now that's reality, isn't it? I mean, if you ever go out and walk on the streets of Cordell and you find a dog that's not too friendly, all it takes, all it takes is a stick in your hand. And that dog will only come so close. For 20 years of my life, I was a jogger. I ran six miles a day, six days a week, and never missed unless it was lightning. It could be snowing, it could be raining, and yes... It was an addiction, and no addiction is right. But if I had chosen a path, if I knew I was going to go on this day a particular path where there was a dog that was unleashed or out of the yard and angry, I would always carry a stick, and those dogs would never come very close. It must have been the same back in that day. That's Goliath's observation. Am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? You, you come over here. And I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to leave your carcass to the birds and the wild animals. That, too, hasn't changed, has it? If you leave anything unburied, what happens? A couple of weeks ago or so, I had to haul off another dead calf. This one was fairly large. Uh, I took it down in a pasture in kind of a depression, a couple of days later, I looked over and I saw these great big birds, the vultures. So I decided to drive over and take a look. Now, you may not like what I'm about to say, but sure enough, the eyeballs were gone. If you read anything about the vultures, that's the first thing they take. They take the eyeballs. And it was obvious that something else like a coyote had been there eating on this carcass. It's always been that way. And Goliath said... Young boy, that's just a, that's what I'm going to do to you. And David looks at him and says, no, no. I'm going to knock you down and cut off your head. The Lord's going to do it. Because you have defied the armies of the living God. You've insulted God. Now I'm wondering this morning how you feel when you hear someone insulting God or His Son, Jesus, how does it make you feel? It happens all the time these days. If you watch very much news, if you listen very much at all to what's being said, it is a constant, when they get the opportunity at least, ridicule, of Christianity and a ridicule of our God. How does that make you feel? Well, let me ask you this. How does it make you feel when someone insults your father on this earth? Now, it's not happened to me in my lifetime, really, except for once. And it really wasn't meant to be a ridicule, I don't think, but I know exactly where I was. I know exactly what I was doing. I was on a playground at Jefferson Grade School in the south part of town. A lot of you don't even know that existed. As I always tell people, remember what I tell them? It's the school that used to be in Cordell for the gifted and talented. Okay? Because Randy and Gretchen Gerringer went there, and they were really, really smart. Okay? Some of the rest of us just tagged along. Okay? But I was out on the basketball court playing basketball with a bunch of boys, and someone made reference to my dad and said something about my old man. That was the phrase. Now, that's a common phrase. I hear other people say, my old man told me to go do this, or my old man did this. I've never used that. And I remember when that person said that, becoming flash mad, flash angry. 
Now, it did not come to a fight, but it could have been close. How do you feel when our Father in heaven who made this world, who redeemed us, is insulted? And I hope you have indignation. And I would not call anyone to go into physical battle, and I would not call anyone to be in that kind of arena, but surely, surely, it would cause us to be so angry we'd speak to God about these people abusing His name. And now the second thought. David makes absolutely sure in this story that Goliath and everybody else until this moment in time for all of us know that it's the power, it's the salvation, and it's the glory of God. Now, it would be so easy for someone like me to go into that battle and let it go to my head a little bit and think, I was pretty good, because this is a phenomenal story. He picks up five stones. He doesn't know exactly how the battle's going to go. He's just confident that God's going to win the battle. But do you realize slinging one stone and hitting in the forehead, do you realize how unlikely that is? This giant is armor clad. Remember the bronze armor? The helmet? And it's like the scales of a snake, a fish, all over his body. He just has a little narrow opening for that rock to sail into. I I, I might have said something like, it's good that I've been practicing a long time. Yeah, I'm pretty good with the sling. No. No. David says, everyone is going to know. He says the entire world is going to know that there is a God in Israel. They're going to know that with a stick and with a sling, you can't kill a giant. God's going to kill this giant. God gets the glory. It stopped me and made me think about how that's what God's always wanted. Several years ago, there was a young woman at Lubbock Christian University named Marnie. Always liked the name Marnie, and she was pretty too. And she was pretty on the inside, humble, beautiful spirit. One year, she became homecoming queen. She graduated, went back to Colorado, married, I think had two children, But in her words, she married, I think it was a police officer, and he was unfaithful to her many, many times. So she was in the midst of a divorce. When she returned to campus, because during homecoming, they always bring back someone from the past who was a homecoming queen, and she's she's up there part of the homecoming court. And then they all get invited to our house, Sue's would host them, for a homecoming queen's tea. And Marnie was talking to Susan later to me, and we were talking about how she was handling this, how well she was doing. Marnie's favorite famous statement was this, to God be the glory, to God be the glory. It's God who gets the credit. I've told you many times, I had two ladies that worked for me for all the years I was out there. One of them worked with just a little bit of an exception of a bit of time, and the other one, Anita, worked from the day I arrived till the day I left. Uh, They, like everyone else, had struggles in life. Everybody has struggles in life. But Anita, particularly at times, but Anita would always, always, always be so quick to say when you would talk about how well she was doing or how she handled something or how something went right, and she would always say, to God be the glory. May God be glorified. Those words were as common and natural to her as any other words she could possibly use. 
And do you remember what Jesus said about us letting our light shine? That may people may see our good works, so that what? So that our Father in heaven is glorified. It's not about me. It's not about pats on the back. It's about me going through life with the attitude, may God be seen today in a positive light. That's what glorification means. May God be seen in a better light, a positive light, by the way I live. And David said, Mr. Goliath, you've got it all wrong. There'll be birds that come, all right. There'll be animals that come and eat of the carcasses but won't be mine because God's going to allow me to knock down your knock you down and cut off your head and that's exactly what he does David puts a stone right here so embedded and so deep that Goliath falls face down now the scripture is a little confusing because it says he's dead but it also says he killed him a little bit later when he went over and pulled that sword out of the sheath. See, David didn't own a sword. You'll find that in the next chapter. He did not own a sword. I wonder how large and how huge that sword was. And he cut off his head. And David says, it's not one thing due to me. Everyone in the world will know that there is a God who has power, who saves, and is to be glorified. That's why people need to believe this story. That's why people need to be telling this story across this nation over and over again. It's God who can bring it all together in right ways. So, how do you feel when God is insulted? I hope it stings deeply. When you do your good things that God has enabled you to do, be careful about the pats on the back. To God be the glory. Now, an observation. I, I may be way off on this observation. But when David cuts off Goliath's head, you know what he does? Makes me think he was a really young boy. He wags it around. In fact, Saul will have him to come to his tent and he'll come wagging that, I assume holding it by the hair, that head. I found myself this week wondering how big it is. I mean, I wear a hat size of a seven and a fourth, and I have to stretch it just a little bit. I wonder if his hat size would have been nine, nine and a half, ten, eleven. But think about young boys when they make their first kill. We've got one grandson who likes guns. So a neighbor's already taken him deer hunting. He's killed a deer. He killed a badger. I think that was his first thing to kill. Do you know where the skin of the badger is right now? It's tacked up on his wall in his bedroom. I mean, you can just see our grandson being so proud. Pop, I, I, I shot and it hit that badger. I killed the badger. He's so... I don't think that's exactly what David's doing, but he's got that head, and he's so thrilled. But I can imagine him saying to everyone, look, here's what you're afraid of. Look what God did. But he's still a young boy, and he's still human. It's maybe not humorous to you, but it's kind of humorous to me that he wags that head around for a while. Don't know how long, but for a while. So, hold on to all that. Because of how we're doing things these days, at least for right now, we move right into our communion. I now, for many, many weeks, have tried to tie the two together. We're about to remember the greatest event to happen on this earth. We're about to remember God coming to this earth in the form of his son, brutally killed, but raised from the dead, 
that death would not hold any sting for any of us. And that's because His blood provides the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what we remember. But do you realize that God did all that through Jesus on His own? It wasn't because of any goodness inside of me. It wasn't because I deserved anything. It wasn't because you deserved anything or you were so good. He did it because He loved us. He loved us and wanted us to have salvation. And so this moment is a remembrance, but it's a remembrance of God's wonderful love and it is a statement of His glory. To God be the glory even in this. Great things He has done. The greatest of all, being the gift of His Son, Jesus. For without it, there's nothing left but to live, as Bert said, in a fallen, struggling world and to die hopelessly. But not because of Jesus. God gets the credit. So think about that as we take these emblems this morning. I want to read from Corinthians 1, 11, verse 23, Paul talking to the Corinthians here. For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for sending your son to die for us and to to be resurrected, that we have the opportunity to be with you in heaven. And you've given us that assurance. We take this bread at this time as a remembrance of his body that was hung on the cross. Help us to always remember what he has done for us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Dear God, as we continue our communion with you, we want to give you thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood, which was shed on that cross, and that bread, that blood that continually cleanses us each and every day. We want to take this fruit of the vine as a remembrance to that blood that was shed for us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, it's beginning to feel like summer out there, isn't it? One day this week, my pickup showed 103 degrees. And I guess everybody's cutting wheat, and Ben and Cammy and the taters are all cutting wheat, and I'm supposing that Ben and Cammy and the children will all be leaving for very long. I, I, I want to tell you how thrilled I am and thankful to you that you keep coming. And, and I know that uh, a lot of us enjoyed watching it on the live stream, and, uh, and it has been very effective, thanks to Burke. Uh, as, as, as Janet said when she walked through the back doors, <coughs> You know, Burke, I mean, Greg and the two Gregs and I were standing there, and she said, now, Burke, uh, some, here's what I heard at least. Uh, without you, we would have nothing. And, I <laughs> and she, she's right. <laughs> she's right. So it, uh, but I, I, I thank you for coming back together. And even, even separated like this, and, and uh, to me it's been kind of exciting. And I, I don't know, doing it a little differently that's had more meaning for me too, uh, but we'll see how things go. But thank you for being here. We, we're going to have a, a last song. It it doubles as an invitation song, and uh, all, all of you. I, I look across the audience. You've been in the church buildings as long as I have, and and you, you know what that means. And I would say this. I, I tell you again, it's the power of our God. It's the salvation of our God that matters most in our lives right now. I hope you're taking complete, full advantage of that and that you are in Christ and happy to stay in Christ. So let's stand and sing our song. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so much he loved. come before our church family this morning with a request. We've been, several men here in the community and in the church family here work with the home and we have a problem at the home. We have residents and staff that have worked tirelessly and have received the results of zero problems as far as this virus goes. However, they're both, the residents and the staff are very, very tired. We had a board meeting the other night and asked the administrator, Gail, what can we do? And she just looked at us and said, pray, 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 pray. So I come before you this morning asking each of you this week for a few extra prayers for those people. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you once again for this another beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. Father, thank you for allowing Doris and Janet to return with us, Father, as they have been confined also. Father, please, if it be thy will, please 
rid us of this virus problem that our friends and loved ones in the Cordell Christian home can return to their normal life, Father. I know we have problems in the world, Father, far greater than that. But this group of people just goes unmentioned because they're not an integral part of our life. But Father, for all the great things you have done, I'm sure this request would be much, much appreciated. Father, as we go through this week, may we take an extra few minutes and remember these people, Father. Lift up their spirits, lift up our hearts as we think of them. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.